I'm Eric, your president. I'd like to uh, respect the fact that we've got an all-Republican uh, event here today by reminding you that we've shifted the flags to the right. We did that for a reason. Uh, it's kind of a, a partisan joke, but uh, I want to remind you that we do broadcast this on community television. Tualatin Valley Community Television is our provider. In addition to that, we also share the programs for free on YouTube. So the reasons the flags were shifted to the right is so we can make the candidates look as good as possible. And from looking at how sharp they're dressed today, I'd say they don't need the help that I'd normally give uh, other parties. Okay, well, thanks, uh, thanks for the courtesy chuckle from a few of you. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Uh, the candidates get some media assets, and of course I've mentioned a couple of them, but there's uh, two more. And uh, Joseph, would you bring me up in the room just a little bit so they can hear me? I'd like to let you know that we also broadcast this on Podomatic.com. The URL is WashingtonCounty.Podomatic.com, rhymes with automatic. So if you have an eye thingy like an Apple uh, iPhone or an iPad, an iPod, you can download that and listen to it at your leisure. We also take a lot of pictures, and we post that to our Facebook page, which is uh, Facebook.com slash Washington County Public Affairs Forum. I'd like to make an ask, and that is the forum is volunteer run, and as we move into our next forum season, which will commence next September, the forum is run by volunteers on our board of directors, and if you choose to serve, you would have my gratitude, but it is necessary for that service for this organization to continue. Uh, and we have a number of leadership opportunities, such as president, vice president, treasurer, webmaster, and various uh, uh, boards of directors. So please see me or any one of the other board members that are in the room who are going to raise their hand. If you're on the board, would you raise your hand? If you're not on the board, would you give them some applause? I'd like to announce the candidates and the order in which they will appear. Uh, first, we're going to have uh, CD1 race, um, or excuse me, um, House District 32. We're going to have first up Rick Rose, and then Luis DiMartino's up second. Th then we're going to have the uh, first CD uh, candidates in this order. Bob Niemeyer, uh, Delinda Morgan, and Jason Yates up third. All candidates are going to get eight minutes to make their presentation, and then we'll follow up with a little bit of Q&A. So we will conclude the District 32 race uh, first with Q&A, and then we'll transition into the first congressional district race with Q&A concluding our program. So I'd like to uh, welcome uh, Mr. Rick Rose up to the podium, and we'll get you on here in just a second. So um, I'd like to, uh, as Rick's coming up, uh, ask that as you check out and pay your, your tab, that uh, you remember our servers. They work really hard to make sure that our food's hot and ready, and, uh, and behind the scenes, they, they really do a great job. So I'd encourage you to remember them with a tip as you check out. So I'd like you to uh, now give uh, Mr. Rick Rose a warm round of applause. Wow, well, I appreciate you making me look good. Um, sure trying. Does this also take off 10 pounds? Um, we can do that in post. We can do that in post. All right, great. Uh, my name is Rick Rose. I'm running for House District 32. Uh, first off, I'd just like to say I really appreciate being invited. Um, I'm really glad to be here. A couple things I wanted to talk about was uh, I own a care home for developmentally disabled in Warrington, Oregon. And uh, I started thinking about running and people came to me and asked me some things about running. And one of my concerns was uh, how we're wasteful the money is that they're spending in Salem. And we're seeing it all over the place, but especially in, in my house and in our, our district, um, just a lot of wasteful spending. And for instance, I own a care home for, there are care homes and there's foster care homes and then there's group homes. Well, I have a foster care home and the difference between a foster care home and a group home, uh, the state can pay three and four times more for a group home than a foster care home. For instance, if somebody in my home is paying 2400 a month for us to take care of, and they move that person with the same needs into a group home, they can pay as much as eleven or $12,000 for the same person and actually get less care. So that was very concerning to me, and I used to have a senior home, and I was really upset because of how our seniors were being taken care of. Uh, and the same situation there, 
we would take care of a senior for two or three thousand dollars and they would move into a nursing home and pay nine or ten thousand dollars with less staffing and less care. In my care home we have four residents with three plus staff. So why are we paying so much more for a group home compared to a foster care home? Uh, another thing, I wanted, reason I got into this is I'm president of the Parent and Teachers Association in Warrington. And as I started looking up education, I just wanted to run some things by you. In 2013, we were ranked, uh, excuse me, in 2004, we were ranked number 14th in the nation on education. In 2013, 2013 we're ranked 43rd. My children go to school, and I'm sure a lot of people here, their children go to school, and their grandchildren go to school. Well, I'm not happy with 40, number 43. And uh, so that's why I decided I wanted to run uh, and really started looking into it. I'm also on the budget committee for Warrington, grade, grade, uh, Warrington District, school district. And... When we started looking at the budget, over four years, we had to cut $5.9 million. And that's considered a small school district. And so we started looking at ways to save. And, you know, a lot of the issues that are coming up, I feel like if we can cut the waste, we can put that money into other areas um, that are needed. We need jobs. And, and I think that's one thing we can put money into as far as maybe training and helping people get those jobs. But not only that... Um, it starts out with education, and as they grow up, and we can train them, but we also need uh, businesses coming in. We have one of the highest capital gains in the national in the country, right here in Oregon. So those were a few reasons I wanted to wanted to run, and um, also uh, I'm a little bit of a different kind of Republican. Uh, I'm a Republican, but I'm also in the union. And I'm in the union because of the business I run, we are, you don't even have a choice to, to be in it. You are just automatically in it. So I decided that if I'm going to be in it, I might as well work and fight for what I believe in. And in three years, I've worked my way up to vice president of um, our local and SEIU. So now they're kind of nervous because um, they kind of don't know what to do with me. Um, the first response was, but you're a Republican. And uh, I said, well, I've worked right beside you for three years, and we fought for the same things, and, and we've achieved our goals. I said, just think what we can do if all of us come together. And from what I understand, I have a good chance of having their support and actually having them uh, behind me. So I'm really proud of that. I am willing to work with all sides and do what's best for Oregon. So I'm running for District 32. Uh, my Facebook is James Rick Rose, uh, and I appreciate being able to be here, and thank you. Um, you know, we're going to have questions up uh, after your opponent okay. speaks. Sure. Uh, when, uh, you're, we'll have you up here. And so... Um, Who's up next? Okay, come on up. Hi. My name is Lou DiMartino. I'm running for District 32, same as Rick here. Um, he talks about uh, why he's running, and I'll tell you why I decided to run. Started, uh, started thinking about the $17 trillion that the uh, United States owes and all the waste, and it goes down, trickles down to the state. And then it goes to uh, each uh, district. And what really made me decide is that, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with uh, Highway 6, but there is a uh, turnoff called Wilson River, Wilson River Loop. And it has a flashing light there, but it's 65 miles an hour. Uh, so the state decided, or the county, whatever, they uh, decided to put in uh, a turnaround, so they changed everything, and it came out to uh, pretty close to seven and a half million dollars, and it's a pretty much of a big waste in our district. And I'm thinking, why couldn't 
the representative of our district do something and save that particular money. Uh, would have been easier to leave the light up, cut the speed, speed limit two miles down the road, there's a speed limit of uh, 45. They could have made that speed limit 45 all the way up, put a saturation uh, police force there for a month or so, they could have saved, maybe even made some money on tickets, but they could have saved seven and a half million dollars. And that could have went for schools, for senior citizens, and if that's just one part right there, uh, it's all over the district. And, I'm, and I think that uh, a dollar here and a dollar here or there is something to be, be really worried about. Uh, I have, uh, I'm a retired guy, and I've had, uh, I worked 25 years with the Oregonian. I was a distributor. I had 13 employees. Well, they're not employees. They're independent contractors. And half of them were Hispanics. Great, great people. Anyway, um, before that, I owned a restaurant. Um, I uh, had a place in Portland called Rusty's Ranch Burger. I never worked so hard for so long for so little in my whole life. Worked there about five years. I was uh, the people working for me making more than me per hour at the very end. So anyway, uh, there's so much. The way to get business, people, people, uh, employers, they don't hire so much because they want somebody already experienced. And that costs money to train. Now, if we did a little incentive for the businesses, back in my Rusty Rent, they had a deal through the state where they kicked back a little bit, and so I was hiring more people. And then at the end, they were trained when uh, funds ran out, they were great employees because I trained them, and I knew how they, what they did, and I kept them forever until I had to sell out. Because, you know. But uh, I'm also uh, chairman of the uh, Twin Rocks Sanitary District. Uh, the rates went up several years before I got in there, and... Uh, we were just at our last meeting last week, we had several retired people there, and they say, are you going to raise the rates? Are you going to raise the rates? Well, we come to the conclusion we don't have to raise the rates, which we didn't. But we gotta, you got to balance out. We have uh, three, three loans out for government loans. So we got to make sure that we have a rainy day fund and pay it, which in the last couple of years that I've been there, we do have a rainy day fund. In fact, uh, some of the... Sewers are uh, asbestos, and they're starting to deteriorate. And luckily, we, they have to come up. We had a bid for $76,000 to fix one street, which is the worst. And you don't have to tear up the whole pipe. If you do it ahead of time, you stick a pipe inside before it gets too de deteriorated. And so that's what we did. So we have a rainy day fund, and, uh, and so everything's balanced out, no rate raise. And also, I, I'm very proud, I'm, uh, I'm uh, uh, a deacon at uh, Rockaway Community Church also. And uh, I come into town here several times uh, a month. My mother, uh, she's living by herself, she's 98, and my aunt lives next door, she's 100. And they're both self-sufficient, but... Uh, so I come in and do my little yard work or whatever it needs there, or change a light bulb. But um, so I'm really familiar with senior citizens, and I'd like to work with them in that they can stay in their house as long as they can, instead of going to a home, which they're not comfortable at. So I just want to do the best for District 32. I'm not worried about the state large. I just want 32 and work on it. And, and also, uh, there's so much things with, uh, with uh, education, too. Uh, you know, a common Core is coming in, and that is a real bummer. Uh, there is like a Governor Cuomo in New York, most liberal uh, governor is. He's put a hold on it now, too, and has a committee checking it out. So why test the kids in nine hours testing somebody and find out 
that uh, it doesn't really work. And I have really some great ideas about local schools, and uh, maybe they should have testing when they come in from grade school to high school, and the ones, because they want uh, uh, math to be part of it. And if you test the one, see, not everybody's going to go to college. Not everybody. In fact, most of them aren't. And test the ones who are math academic and put them in a different class. Let them excel. Have maybe uh, one and two regs or whatever they call it to help. So basically, I'm for uh, elderly, education, and work. And that's why I'm running. Thank you. If I could get both candidates to come on up, we're going to take a few questions. If you come on, come on up, have a seat over here. And, uh, and uh, Mr. Rose, if you'd come up and have a seat, we'll uh, start questions in just one moment. Jim, could you give me uh, 30 seconds? Folks, we've got time for about three or four questions. If you have a question, could you ask it in 30 seconds or less? When you ask the question, would you let us know if it's for one or both of the candidates? And if it's for one, please identify them. Jim, would you please start us off? Um, Jim Kate, four member. Question for both candidates. Um, this seems like a gerrymandered district. Can you discuss the shape of the district and like what part is in Washington County? And is there an incumbent? And what is your opinion of the incumbent? Thank you. Um, well, I know they redistricted um, this last year or so. Um, from what I understand, it was supposed to help, partially help Republicans, partially help Democrats. Um, that's about all I know on that. As far as the incumbent, um, my, my feelings are 10 years uh, of being a state representative has never been asked to lead a committee um, but overall is a nice person, but I don't think we need a nice person. I think we need somebody that will get the job done. Well, about the redistricting, uh, I'm not really familiar with it. I just, uh, you know, same as Rick there. But uh, for, uh, for Debbie, she's our uh, it's, it's District 32. She's been there... Uh, I consider her a lifer, tell you the truth. And uh, I'm interested, I think the person should be interested in not themselves, but the district itself. And when I seen this waste, and for seven and a half million dollars that could have been spent so much better and easier and cheaper than anything else. Now, um, I had somebody talk to her about why didn't they, and she kept saying, well, it was thought of way before I got there. If she can't do anything better in her district, and she doesn't have a say in her district, she shouldn't be there. Harry Bodine, foreign member. Back in 99, I was able to spend the last month of the legislative session in Lincoln, Nebraska, the only legislature in the United States, nonpartisan and one house. And by the way, it's less half the cost of our legislature in Oregon. About My question is, uh, it's a different world where not half the people in the room are trying to put the other half of the room out of business. Your thoughts on this, this concept? Both of you? Well, um, what I feel on that is um, <clears throat> I, I think as, as I've looked over uh, being a union member and being able to work with both sides, I think that's very important. And what we talked about with the union was, oh my gosh, the Republicans and Democrats on so many issues are that far apart, but n none of the Democrats can say, I want to sit down with the Republican and figure it out, and vice versa. I'll do that. I will sit down with both sides and we will come out with a, a better plan. And um, that's why I'm proud to be part of the union um, and have been able to work with them to the point where, like I said, I've been elected vice president of the local. And uh, 
<clears throat> they knew I was Republican the whole time. So us being able to work together and even come up with a budget for um, our industry was huge. And I think somebody's got to break it down and say, we came together and came up with a, uh, came up with a, a plan and did it together. Democrat didn't lead, a Republican didn't lead, it needs to be done together. Well, I think the bottom line is, how do you get along with other people? You let them talk and you listen. You hear what they say, and then you give them your information and your ideas. And then you work together on something like that. That's the only way to, uh, to uh, accomplish anything, is to listen to the other person. If you don't listen and you're going, blah, 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 you ain't going to convince anybody. Thank you. Jerry Arnold, forum member. My question is for both of you. And thank you for being here today. Um, the question is, would you support increased logging on state forest land? You betcha. There is so much land that uh, needs to be there uh, on logging. And our pretty little spotted owl, uh, I bet you there's more than they think laying around. And there's a lot of Mill City and so forth. They're out, they died up because of that. I think we should uh, make sure, and I think if you talk to the uh, Democrats, too, they want jobs, and they're all good-paying jobs. In fact, uh, down there at uh, Rockaway, a couple of the people I know are log truck drivers. And I would push it 150%. Thank you. Uh, absolutely. Um, you know, there's so much land here that the federal government owns in Oregon. I, I don't know exactly what the percentage is, but it's over 50%. And the only th in fact, we were talking about it on the way here. You know, as you're driving down Highway 26, and you see where it's cut out. Um, you know, we need more jobs. And the answer is not what Debbie Boone's saying as far as training. We need to lower the capital gains uh, tax and let these people come in. But as far as the logging, absolutely. But the only thing I would ask, and, and people that live in my foster care home would say, is do it away where we can't see it. But uh, absolutely, we need jobs. When we get jobs, it's going to help the tax base. And a lot of these things that we need to do can be do done better. And uh, so, yes, I, I would be for that. Thank you. Folks, I ask that you give both these candidates a big round of applause. Thank you both. Here. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Appreciate it. As I invite uh, Bob, Jason, and Delinda to come up, and uh, please, if you come up and uh, take a seat, we'll get uh, uh, Bob up first. I want to remind you of forum protocol, and that is, is that we ask that if you have not joined the forum as a paid member, you can for just $45 per season. And it, the privilege of membership is that you get to ask the question during the program as it's recorded, and that is the benefit of membership. So uh, my tw uh, arm twist to you is if you've got a red name tag and you haven't joined us yet, please consider doing so. Uh, so uh, protocol again, eight minutes each. We'll have uh, Bob Niemeyer, then we'll have Delinda uh, Morgan, and then finally Jason Yates, eight minutes each, and then the balance of the forum program will be your questions. So I ask that you give a big round of applause to Bob Niemeyer. Thanks for being here. Take it away. And oh, candidates, please watch for Marilyn McWilliams. She has cue cards and we'll yes. signal you at two minutes, one minute, 30 seconds, and cut. This is very, very similar to Toastmasters. My name is uh, Bob Niemeyer, and I'm running for First Congressional District. I'm an independent mechanical engineer, and I've worked out of home for 28 years now, specializing in product development. I uh, can take pretty much anybody's idea and turn it into a manufacturable article and put it out onto the marketplace. Very much used to having people come to me with their life savings, in some cases, in order to try and better their own lives by starting a business for themselves. That's a lot of responsibility, and it's the type of thing that I think our politicians in Washington, D.C. need to understand, how their tax dollars are basically the same thing. There's their, their homes, their futures, everything that they give to the government 
is what they uh, are trying to keep our nation being what it is today. I have three reasons for being here today. The first and foremost is to try and rebuild our independence. I personally believe that if we rebuild our independence, our jobs will follow. There's many things that are, are, our nation has lost its independence on, particularly things like the military or Social Security. I actually think that Social Security is a way for our senior citizens to be independent, where they actually have a value to society and a reliable income that they can count on to be able to exist in some cases. About 40% of senior citizens are on Social Security with that being their only source of income. Another thing is uh, rebuilding our education is very, very important to our independence. Because later down the road as our students grow up and become part of our nation in their workforce, their education is going to help them make better lives for us all and, our, and a better independence for us all. And as a side note, I'm 100% for a voucher program in an education system so that we get competition for real that our parents can actually decide what they need for their children, not somebody in bureaucrat in, in the Salem or someplace in the federal government. And there happens to be 91 federal agencies right now that need to be gotten rid of on the federal level. That's one of the things I'm going to attack first when I get to Washington, D.C. The second reason, I want this nation to see its 500th birthday. Things are not going very good right now, and I can see how we're going to be crashing into some very serious problems with many of the happenings that are going on here today. This nation is 238 years old right now, and we'd really like to see a decent celebration for our 250th. Uh, the 200th birthday was during Jimmy Carter, and it was a really fizzle. I didn't have much fun during our first uh, 200 years uh, on, our, on that birthday because there was a Democrat in the House, uh, in the Washington. The third reason that I'm here is I believe that nobody, particularly Americans, should have to live their lives in fear. There's a lot of little things going on, and I'll use Social Security as an example, where some people have a fear that their, their Social Security may be cut and they become destitute. Well, that's what's going on when Congress, in its effort to try and delay and uh, when you can actually start receiving your Social Security, that a lot of people are becoming very concerned over. My sister is a good example. She just one year past the cutoff, and she has to wait now till she's 67. But all of her life, she talked about 65, because that's all my dad ever talked about was 65. My mom talked about 65. So my sister was actually thinking 65, and now it's all of a sudden 67. And who knows if it's not going to be changed to 70, or even worse. There's <clears throat> so there's one, uh, only one fear that I have in all of that I'm doing right here today and running for this office. And there's, uh, that fear is simply this. I have am concerned what the Democrat Party is going to be willing to do in an effort to prove that they're right. Now, I have no doubt that there's many Democrats in office right now that believe that they're doing what they think is right for the people of the United States of America. It's the ones that are in office that will do absolutely anything to prove that they're right. Now, our health care system and Obamacare and Hillary Care are fine examples of this. Hillary Care was, you know, a boondoggle in the late 90s. I mean, it got really shut down by the people welling up being angry about such a thing. 
Well, Obama came along with a vengeance and even had a weapon of the IRS to enforce what he was trying to do. And there's a lot of people that are really concerned about what our government has done. And I look at it as Obama trying to prove that he's right, that the government can control health care. We need to replace those people in office who think that the government can do things better than the private sector. That is the most important thing for us all to do, is to be able to recognize, recognize those types of people who are out to prove they're right. A lot of Republicans that have seemed to gone over to the left side are doing that exact same thing. And that is kind of a, a, a way of, of demonstrating how we can tell the difference when a Republican is out doing the same thing to prove that he's right he shouldn't be in office. He's there to represent the people, to make sure that the laws that we all have uh, in our, coming from our nation are based upon independence and uh, the future of this nation. Thank you. I'd like to introduce Delinda Morgan, if you want to come up. Thank you, Eric, for having me, and thank you to the Public Affairs Forum. I think that your work here is very valuable to all candidates, and it's wonderful to be with you. My name is Delinda Delgado Morgan. I am Spaniard on my mother's side and Mexican on my father's side. So that's my family history. I am married to my campaign manager, <laughs> Lance Morgan, former Marine Corps officer. He flew CH-53s for uh, the uh, Marine Corps. And I, we actually met when I was the contractor. Uh, we had a small family business. It was a construction business. And I was the contractor that was requested to resurface the heliport at Tustin Marine Corps Air Station. And I did, and I want to say we didn't date until two years after that job was completed. <laughs> Very professional. We have three sons. Our sons, um, our oldest son went to college for a couple years. College wasn't for him. He decided to get into construction, and he also became an inspector for structural um, anything structural, rebar, concrete, buildings, and Katrina hit when he had graduated his uh, structural class, and his heart told him to get out there and help those people in New Orleans. And he went over there, and he lived in a hotel, and he was bussed in. And a lot of times they were working for 10-hour days, and when they bussed them to their areas, they didn't even give them water, food or water. So. There were many people in that area that realized how much help these people were giving them that were inspecting their property so that they could get some help. And when my son came home, he came home with not a lot of money, but a very warm heart, and he had felt that he had done his duty, that he had used the, what he had learned to help the people in that catastrophe. Those are the kind of children that we are very proud of and we have raised. Our, also, he has a theater company. He was into theater, and uh, him and his wife have a murder mystery movie theater company. My other two sons decided to go to college. Western Oregon University for the middle son. He graduated. He uh, now, next month, will be graduating from Pepperdine University in Malibu. And I am very proud to say he's a very hard worker, and he is graduating with no debt due to his hard work and family chipping in and tightening our belts so that we could really give them a future with graduating school and no debt. And our youngest son graduated University of Alaska Anchorage with uh, a couple of degrees, global logistics, marketing, and supply chain management. He got out into the working world, put in a lot of applications here in Oregon also there weren't any jobs. There's a lot of kids that have degrees without jobs. So he went back to Alaska. 
He will be starting his master's program in September, but he works two jobs. And when he started working in the construction business, because, well, I guess he takes after my side of the family, <laughs> um, he uh, was able to get a job that was a well-paying job and able to get married. And last month, he just bought his first home. So we're very proud of my family. I just wanted to tell you that so that you would know that we come from a very self-sufficient, self-starting um, family. We have two businesses. We have the martial arts school for a lot of years, and we have a Pinot Noir vineyard that my husband and I both work our vineyard. We don't have a staff. We don't hire people. Um, I'm not naive enough to think that I can go to Washington, D.C., and I'm the only one that wants to create jobs. I have a job-creating experience, and there are people there that do want to create jobs, and we need to work together to find the best way that we can get federal government out of the way. They have overbearing regulations, and we really need to let the entrepreneurial spirit and the job creators like myself, uh, be out from under that oppression of federal government. Um, creating opportunity is, in my opinion, very easy. I, was, uh, I had a meeting with a local logger the other day. Someone mentioned logging. And our loggers, our private loggers right now, instead of planting 200 trees per acre, they're planting 420 trees per acre. And they're doing that because they know that replanting those extra trees, when those trees grow to seven to 10 years, they can thin out the ones that are scraggly and use them for wood products. They use the harvest. It pays for them harvesting the trees. And then at 15 to 20 years, they can have a second harvest. And that second harvest, they're using wood products. But they're also giving the healthiest trees the best chance. So they're growing trees right now in 40 years, what used to take 100 years from nature. We have conservators in this state that need to be cut loose. Uh, Congressional District 1 only has 3% federal forest. The statewide, 53% of the state is owned by federal government. So in our district, it's not as much as other districts, but we really need to concentrate on how to create the most wealth for our schools, our senior citizens, our taxpayers from the um, from our forest, our fishing industries, and all of our small businesses. I want to thank you very much for having me again. My name is Delinda Delgado Morgan. I'm running for Congressional District 1. And I have executive manager skills. And with those skills, I want to use them to help the people of District 1 so that we can be the most prosperous. I also want to add in education, we don't only need to be book smart, we need to be work smart. And if we can help kids learn, get them involved with programs like my Earn and Learn program in Yamhill County where kids are able to learn something they want to learn. And on top of that, they're learning skills that will help them in the job community. Then we'll have kids that actually direct all their resources towards learning something that will help them in the future. Um, and if you want to help children, you, anyone can go to a sporting event, can buy a kid a pair of shoes, can do something in your local communities that really helps children know that we care about them. Thank you very much. Third up, I'd like to welcome Jason Yates. <laughs> Thank you very much for having me. As he said, my name is Jason Yates, and I'm running for the United States House of Representatives here in the first district to unseat Suzanne Bonamici. A lot of people want to know a little bit about me. I moved here from Atlanta, Georgia, a little tiny country town about an hour northwest of there called Kingston, Georgia. It was a town of 400 people, so everyone knew everyone. And the businesses there supported each other and the families were extremely close as well. 
And we always helped our neighbors. We helped our friends down the street. We had a tornado come through our town when I was a teenager. And the whole town banded together to help rebuild that neighbor's house within two weeks of it being destroyed. I moved here about seven years ago. Um, my wife is originally from Yamhill, and she's a second-generation Oregonian. And met her when we were in Georgia, and she brought me back here. I fell in love with the place and decided I never want to leave Oregon again except to go to Washington, D.C. for a few years. I have uh, two sons, a four-year-old named Caleb and an 18-month-old named Ezra. And I know that one day those two boys are going to look at me and say, Dad, why didn't you do anything to help our future? Why is this debt crippling us? Why can't we get a job? Why are our student loans so high? That's why I decided to put my name into the hat, to make this place a better place for them, for your family, and for your grandchildren. Now, I would like to announce that I have been endorsed by three different uh, organizations. I've picked up the um, endorsements from the Young Conservatives of Oregon, the Oregon Taxpayers Association, and Oregon Right to Life. Now, my work history, I have worked mostly in warehouse management, where I would go into a business who had a failing warehouse, and what I would do is I would take that, completely do an inventory of their, their products, redraw the warehouse plan, set everything back up, and talk about workflow and efficiency with the people there. And so I was able to do that at three different companies, and that's actually what brought me here to Oregon. I was hired by Evergreen um, Aviation to work in their hel helicopter division, and I was able to find $5 million worth of inventory that they weren't sure that they had that was lost. So I was able to help the company find a couple of million dollars worth of product that they were then able to put on the market and sell and help out. I am also a job creator as well, and in the the series of events that have brought me here, I've provided more than 50 jobs for people across different industries. I now work at Bugbusters Pest Control, and I started there about two years ago after I had a back injury and found out this is the job that I like the best. What it is is Bugbusters Pest Control is based out of Newburgh, and it's a little mom and pop company. When I started, there were only three people, the owner, the office manager, and me. And the company was going downhill. They had lost about 40% of their customer database. And over the last two years, I've built that up and expanded that to the point where I actually just hired a new person last week to help with the customer overflow. And we're hoping that by the end of the summer to make that person a full-time employee that will have enough work to fl flow through the winter time. Now, I have a four-point plan for Oregon that can bring prosperity back. Step one is Obamacare needs to be repealed wholly and completely. And the reason why is because it's a failed program. We can see that here in Oregon, we are ranked 50th out of the country. We have enrolled zero people on the Cover Oregon website. What I would like to do is see that program done away with and allow it to be where you can buy health insurance over state lines. Because if you have 50 states insurance companies fighting for your business, your health care rates are going to go down. I would also like to work with both parties, the Democrats and the Republicans, to do a complete tort reform overhaul so we can get rid of the frivolous lawsuits, which will also drive our health insurance rates down. Part two is the national debt. Yesterday, it went over $17.5 trillion. Now, that's a mind-boggling amount. So I'm going to put it into perspective for you. If you were to take a basketball, and a softball and to put them 24 feet apart. So for those of you here in the room, one on this wall, one on this wall. That is the relative distance between the earth and the moon. If you were to take $17.5 trillion and turn it into dollar bills and stack them on top of each other, does anyone have any idea how far that span would go? Two and a half times to the moon. That that is what we are saddling our children, our grandchildren, and our future descendants with. And that is only the surface debt that we have. That's not even the unfunded liabilities. That's over $100 trillion. What I would like to do is to propose a constitutional amendment that says that a fair and balanced budget has to be passed first before any other bill can even be spoken of or discussed on the floor of the House of Representatives or the Senate. 
which will force both parties to come together to decide what they're going to do. Then all of the other bills that are discussed that year or passed have to fit into the original budget. Step three, Oregon is currently owned by the federal government at 53%, which means that our state isn't even living up to half of its potential. Why is that? It's because we have a handful of Washington bureaucrats that are trying to tell us what is best for us. What I would like to do is to see all land return back to each respective state and to let the state representatives and the county officials decide what is best for that land. If we were to do that here in Oregon, we would open up the 53%, which leads to step four, which is to create or recreate the jobs we have lost. Since 1980, 290 sawmills have shut down, which means we only have less than 100 left working here in Oregon. If we open up just the logging industry here in Oregon again, we will create jobs across the spectrum of industry here in Oregon. Because if the loggers get back on the road, where are they going to buy their gas? Where are they going to buy their new clothes? Where are they going to buy their homes? Here in Oregon which means that you will be able to have a job, your children will be able to have a job, and then when your kids get old enough, they will also have jobs. I'd like to tell everyone to be able to go to my website, yatesforcongress.com. I also have yard signs with me. If you like what you've heard, feel free to come contact me and I can get you one of those or several. And if you would like to help me out on my campaign, any help would be appreciated. Thank you very much. Thank you, candidates. Uh, I'd like to remind you that uh, if you've got a question, please ask it in 30 seconds or less. And if it's for more than one uh, person, please uh, direct your questions. And also, I'd like to stop for a moment and acknowledge Joseph Tyner. If the room sounds good, it's because we have a hardworking man behind the scenes. His name is Joseph, and he does a lot of the AV tech work for our forum. And I ask, would you give him a round of applause? And candidates, we've got a height difference, so please work this microphone, get it under your chin so we can all hear you because you all have great voices. That being said, speaking of great voices, Bill Kroger, would you give us yours? I'm Bill Kroger, a forum member. Thank you all for being here today. I wanted to talk just briefly about Obamacare. Uh, you talked about it a little bit, Mr. Yates. Uh, Obamacare is helping uh, uh, um, quite a few people to get on insurance that haven't had it before. It's done some good things, eliminated the cap, uh, it's allowed uh, young you know, kids to stay on the program for quite a while, eliminated existing conditions. I hear uh, a number of politicians and candidates say they want to eliminate Obamacare, but I really don't hear them say what are they going to replace it with, if anything. Like I said, Mr. Yates spoke about it, but I'd like to hear from the other two, and of course, Mr. Yates, you can add more if you wish. Thank you. Well, my parents are senior citizens also. My dad's 81, my mother's 75, and my father worked until he was 76 years old. And what the federal government did is they started charging my parents $1,300 a month out of their Social Security to help pay for their Medicare. They worked all their life. They saved all their life. Those things are not fair. But... A good replacement for that health care plan that is overwhelming and that stacks up this high in regulations. And it's more than just health care. It is your personal property. It gets to that point that if you don't pay your medical bills, they can come and take your personal property. But I think that there should be interstate commerce. And any big Walmart-like health care plan could also cover pre-existing conditions in children till they're 26. And there also has to be tort reform so that if someone gets a hangnail, they can't sue for millions of dollars. There needs to be that system reformed. And um, pharma pharmaceutical purchasing practices. The VA gets to purchase from and, and get bids from drug companies. So should private insurance companies. Thank you. Obamacare, you may think that people have enrolled. In fact, some actually have. But I defy anybody, any place, to find anybody who has actually been paid for doing work under Obamacare. 
their current system of how they're collecting money may actually be taking in money, but there is no way that a doctor any place can prove that they're on the system yet. There's a lot left for that system to even come close to actually paying somebody. Now I've talked to several doctors uh, behind the scenes, <clears throat> particularly with some of the medical equipment that I do, and every single one of them has absolutely no idea if they are actually going to get paid. And another thing that, that is really kind of scaring some doctors is they think that perhaps with the IRS being the one administering the program that all they're ever going to get is tax vouchers. Nowhere in the Constitution does it say that health care should be mandated. Therefore, it is an unconstitutional law. Obama said that 7 million people have signed up for the health insurance nationwide. Well, he has not said that about that many have already had their insurances canceled because their current insurances are not fitting in with the bronze, the silver, or the gold plan. Therefore, what we need to do is we need to make health insurance more affordable for those that can afford it and then work with the small group that can't afford it. Because out of the 7 million that have signed up under Obama's plan, most of those have signed up for the subsidies. They are not signing up to pay into the program. Therefore, the government is already losing money and everyone else, the 300 million that haven't signed up, know that it's an illegal plan and they're not going to be a part of it. Just like myself, I can't afford it and I will not sign up for it and I encourage each of you to not sign up for it as well and to stand up for your rights. Jerry, Ar Jerry Arnold, forum member, thank you for being here today. My question has to do with the federal gas tax. It was reported in the newspaper recently that there is a looming shortage in the money available for roads. The question is, would you support an increase in the federal gas tax if elected? No. <laughs> Working in construction my entire life, I can see that federal government should not be gathering our, all of our highway dollars and then giving the states back pennies. The Columbia River Crossing is a good example of that. They have spent over $100 million. I think the number is closer to $2 million without a shovel in the ground. Their plan doesn't work. You can't force states to put light rail on that bridge and then, and then expect them to pay millions of dollars for the upkeep. Washington County and Yamhill County have county roads. I live on that road. When I run past the county line, I don't even notice the difference in the color of asphalt. States can do the same thing. States can decide what works out best for each state and then find a way with their gas dollars to pay for those roads and make, make it good. Thank you. I really don't have any idea where federal dollars are being spent on our roads. I don't see it any place. I hear that everybody's asking for the federal dollars to be given to us, but it's just not coming out of Washington, D.C. because it's all in one great big old uh, pot of cash that the Congress is, is spending on. There needs to be something put in place that's based upon the tax dollars that we can that we give to Washington, D.C. via the tax, uh, uh, via the gasoline taxes. And as far as I'm concerned, until we see something from the federal government, for instance, I think that the federal government should be completely paying for the Columbia River Bridge, because we've already given them more than enough money to do that. Just get it spent on our roads instead of other programs that have nothing to do with that gasoline tax. I will also echo what they said as well, that I would not support any new tax increases. 
anywhere in any department, there is enough money there to fix the roads and to keep the roads updated. The way that the budget is being spent right now is being spent on lots of programs that don't actually need to exist. One example would be the Federal Department of Education. Once again, there's nowhere in the Constitution that says that the Federal Department of Education is one of the ones that is allowed. What we need to do is get rid of those programs, return the, that power back to the state, then that money that is raised in the state, such as from transportation, would stay there and would be able to cycle through to fix the roads that need to be done. Chris Leslie, former member. The government is considered inefficient in many things it does. Do you have any pet project that you would like to see improved or cut? Please, if you would answer that question. I have, if you want to call it a pet program, that has to do with uh, solar energy, actually. We saw the Obama administration really mess up a golden opportunity for this nation in, in how the solar panel industry was virtually destroyed and, and sent overseas to China, where they even messed it up. In fact, uh, that solar project, Stab in the Dark, is really at the heart of what went on in Nevada a few days ago. But I believe that places like Eastern Oregon or Nevada have opportunities where if you understand how electricity is being generated, a 10 square mile area is capable of growing enough wood that can be turned directly into fuel that would be more than this uh, Trojan nuclear power plant could ever have generated on an ongoing basis, just circulating through a 10 square mile area. Well, I believe that sh what should have been done is that 10 square mile areas all over the United States should have been turned into solar areas to generate hydrogen, to pipe it out to various places more efficiently than power lines. I have two programs that I would like to see gotten rid of. First of all, the IRS. Um, that is one where we should be able to substitute getting a postcard at the end of the year that says, here's how much you made, here's how much you owe. We don't need an entire tax law. The other program I'd like to see done away with is, is the NSA. That is completely illegal, and whoever is in charge of that should be arrested because you don't need your private information and all of your phone calls being recorded and stored in a database. They're, they're not using that to try to find terrorists. They're trying to find it to use things on us to keep us from being able to stand up and say our, our mind. I would like to give you a little background um, about my family construction company. In 1982, 1983, 1984, and 1985, we were awarded Contractor of the Year. In 1984, President Ronald Reagan personally uh, gave us that award in Washington, D.C. at the Sheraton Hotel. The reason I mention President Reagan is because he made our military strong. He was behind our military. He helped the military. He gave them a living wage. In Congress, my, one of my priorities is to make our military strong again. We are going backwards. Our Navy is at the level of 1919. We need to build our military up. We're strong. We walk softly and carry a big stick. And that is how, in my opinion, peace is kept. You, you know, as a martial artist, the fight that you can walk away from is the fight you win. Thank you. Folks, how about some applause for these amazing candidates? Thank you all.
Folks, what I'd like to do is close down the program by announcing our next program. We're going to meet here again in one week, and we're going to discuss bond opportunities with both Twalton Valley Fire and Rescue and the Beaverton School District. Chief Andy Dyke will be representing Twalton Valley Fire and Rescue, and Linda Degman, who I believe is a board member with the Beaverton School District, will be presenting on behalf of that bond. Uh, thank you for your attendance. Thanks for being here. Look forward to seeing you in a week. Bye-bye.